Hello and welcome to the 13th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Thursday the 8th of October 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This episode was recorded around the time that the George Floyd inspired protest first broke out and so we spent most of the time talking about the crisis in American political life and only tangentially discussed the 18th premiere, if at all. But the discussion was a very enjoyable and enlightened one, so I decided let's put it in as a part of the premiere. This week I have the patron, Andrew Burns, who upped his pledge to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes and live streams, and the chance to join the Emancipation Network Discord, perhaps you too could become a patron from as little as $5 a month. Patrons will also soon be voting on the next choice of Reading Group series. And seeing how it's the second anniversary of the podcast being on Patreon, for all people who sign up in the month of October will receive that most coveted of delights, the the limited edition From Alpha to Omega badge. So now's the time to join. Okay, enough comic grift. Let's join the discussion. Okay, here, here's one we'll kick it off with. Where and how are the establishment going to try and channel what's going on in America on the streets at the moment? Well, what's interesting, I wrote a post about this on my Facebook wall, and I noticed that yesterday everybody was trying to co-opt this. I mean, you had Target writing heartfelt letters to the looters about how uh-huh. it was going to be a <laughs> Wow. But today you're seeing the mayors and a lot of liberal figures starting to scream like agent provocateurs, outside influencers. They're giving Trump some of his, it's all Antifa on the far left, but that doesn't seem to be working. So one of the the ironies about this that I haven't heard talked about, I mean, I heard Trevor Noah do his whole, you know, heartfelt, which I think from Trevor Noah was heartfelt. Fuck Trevor Noah. He's the one that fucking made a big joke of all the people being massacred, the miners in South Africa. He's a fucking shill. Fuck him. He is a shill because he's he's a liberal. He fucking makes John Stewart look like I don't know left wing. Yeah, he's a fucking. He's not even a liberal. Well, I mean, he, you know, he's a liberal. I mean, he he he's, talks, he's a liberal. He <laughs> talked about like the looting of black bodies. He had a good speech on it, but one of the things I noticed that like they won't bring up about why this frustration is happening. And there's also a lot of legitimate anger at black leadership. And uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, like this week in the background was the week that the North star and Sean King went up in flames, like right before this happened. And there's all kinds of financial scandals. So this whole formalization into BLM, into this diversification pushes of the police, which I have never thought, was going to be effective. I think people have given up on it. So there's going to be a lot of scrambling to kind of to kind of reclaim the narrative and pacify it when that doesn't work. And when the boot starts to really come down, you're going to start seeing people screaming about like, oh, this is outside agents, it's agent provocateurs, they're not really from Minnesota. I've already seen a load of tweets by these NGO black influencer types saying that. I don't recognize. I've been around Minnesota all my life. I don't. I don't recognize who are these people. Yeah, they did it in Oakland. They did it. They did it in Ferguson. Yeah. Like so, they're gonna try that again. But what you said off off air, Tom, is like there's been all these tactics that haven't worked. So one of the things about this one is they can't portray this these protest riots revolts in terms of a horde of just black faces like they could the L.A. riots because what we've talked about they're not. But now they're going to try to flip that on its head and say the racial solidarity means, oh, all these people must be outsiders, you know, because we couldn't have white and black people together on this. And I want people to pay attention to that because that narrative, it benefits the white power elite, but it also benefits the black power elite. And it's going to get ugly because they're going to try to divide this up because that, you know, they were seen as supporting it. There's going to be good celebrities like Colin Kaepernick, my God, man. I, I said some things about how that take a knee thing was symbolic 
problem at one time, and I feel bad about it because the, the man is putting money where his mouth is. He's gonna, mm -hmm. he's starting like defenses for people arrested in this in this riot. Yeah, that's what's up. And I also somebody was watching a sports show and told me like one of the old white hands were like, "Well, we should have listened to Kaepernick, and maybe this wouldn't have happened." Um, <laughs> but it does seem like a scramble to get onto this. And let, let's be honest too. This started about police violence. I don't think this is just about police violence anymore. No, it's not. No, it's definitely not. not. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like all this bottled up frustration that it's, from the last, you know, I mean, you know, four years at least, but you know, more than that. And, you know, the pandemic crack, the crackdown, the shitty economy during the crackdown. Look, you don't need a shelter in place order for there to be racist violence, but you know, even a relatively libertarian public health measure that emboldens, you know, the police in any way will result in a, you know, an uptick of policing, which includes, you know, killing innocent people. So, I mean, that's part of it. There's, there's a lot that's been bottled up and people feel totally fucking hopeless in a way that, I mean, I thought people were hopeless last year, you know, like. <laughs> no, but the thing is, hope in the left and in the general public. And I actually don't think these riots are. I, I, I got people mad at me by saying I don't think the riots are left wing in character. I think they're a force of nature. Yeah, they're riots. Uh, right. Right. They're just riots. Like, no, I think they're, they're more left. It swings left. It doesn't swing it, right. It, 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 no, no. I, I agree with you in the sense that the left the left interest overline with the interest of the riots more than any right wing interest does that completely hundred mm -hmm. percent agree. But I don't think most of these people think of themselves as leftists. Maybe they do in Brooklyn, but I don't think they do in Minnesota. Yeah. There's, there's some like kind of, what do you like, mean by that? Like, like there's some think... right communist strongholds where like, you know, this is a kind of festival every like five years or so, or, or, you know, a couple of years, you're not really okay. sure when it's going to pop up, but when it does, hell yeah, we're getting the gang back together. Let's go have fun. And it's kind of like something that the body politic is used to. People in those places generally don't look at riots with fear, but sort of, you know, the more reactionary or the more like, I don't know, quote, normie reaction is often to maybe is just to like roll their eyes or to be like, well, I'm sympathetic, but you know, I'm not going to do anything. But that's, that's, that's only for places that are used to riots. What's special about things like this is that you get riots in places that aren't used to riots. Like that's what happened in Ferguson. That's what's happening here. That's what, in Minnesota, I should say, not, not, not literally here. So, yeah, I mean, this isn't part of the annual ritual of like, let's, no. let's go flip a police car. Atlanta's a little bit more used to riots, but it's still not like this. So one of the things I talked about on my post is I said, I've, you know, I have never felt like the United States was actually at a breakdown. My entire narrative for most of the Trump years is just shit ha that has been said quietly is now being said loud and people are pissed off about it. I don't think that's true anymore. I don't think mm -hmm. that's what's going on anymore. Yeah, um, I lived through the counter revolution in Egypt. I came in at the end of it, and the terrorist campaigns that happened in response to that. I lived through the end of the Satis and Aloha cartel war, which killed tons of people in northern Mexico. And for the first time in my life, stuff in America reminds me of those kinds of events. I wanted to echo a point that was made earlier about the way that uh, sort of diversity policing initiatives have panned out. There's good work from um, John Clegg and an economist named Anadea Ruzmani who do like sort of Marxist corrections and asterisks to the liberal narrative on mass incarceration, talk about the economic origins and also talk about what happens when you do actually get representative policing. You know, they find that, you know, Black people are certainly like less punitive when it comes to like executions and stuff in their own communities. But, you know, structure, the structural stuff remains like people are still concerned about their property and, you know, their person, you know, from gang violence and stuff. And you get a lot of the same dynamics. And it's I think the stats play out that it's 
if it's not worse, then it's, you know, also not necessarily better. And if it's, you know, motivated in the personal sort of hatred way that a lot of liberal narratives on mass incarceration seem to focus on, then, you know, why would that be the case? We shouldn't putting like members of the black community, you know, under the badge, shouldn't that change anything if that's so? If that's I don't know the causal why mechanism at work. That, though. I mean, like, look, like there's a hundred years of race and class traitors in the police. Like, can you name one good cop? Even from like when they were cracking miners' heads in the 20s, I can name one. Hatfield. And he died for it. So like I'm thinking Gene Roddenberry and Christopher Dorner. Like fair enough. And when cops get a conscience like that, you know what they yeah. do? They send in other cops. Yep. <laughs> like, yeah, cops with a conscience generally don't remain cops. I mean, I, somebody was telling me the other day, actually, I was talking to a militia person, and I actually have to believe this. One of the reasons why they're calling in the MPs is while you, the National Guard has plenty of firepower, they're not inclined to use it. And the reason why is they're part time and they're from the area. Yeah, that's classic. I mean, it's classic to deal with any kind of riot like this, right? You you don't send soldiers to attack their own hometown, right? Unless they're extremely disciplined. And that's generally not the case. If you want to do some violence, you're going to bring in people from outside. Like to me, I expect what will happen is it's, I don't, I don't know what to, I don't know what will happen, but uh, I feel as if when, if it's going to be co-opted, we are going to see it being co-opted into the DSA. What do people think? (laughs) Uh, this, I'm, I'm is, this is serious. operating. This is I'm operating definitely... at a completely different level, you know. Like DSA is more or less a purely like political sphere phenomenon. This has social legs. That's what's special about it. Normally, when you see something that really comes from the social sphere, it's rare that the existing kind of political grifts can make the best hay of it. The most effective thing to do is for a new grift to form with people that have, you know, charismatic leadership that come out of these spasms, you know, to like help people sand off their edges and become, you know, part of the machine or something. Right. Um, think about the dominant like Marxist grift parties or whatever now, um, not just the DSA, like the, the PSL and whatever, they were all actually relatively young when Occupy happened and when Ferguson happened and particularly the PSL, well, this wave of them anyway, like, because right. they're sort of older. Well, no, I mean, the PSL starts in 2001 as, as a split off from the WWP. So, yeah, that's older. They go back to the 70s. But the, the dominant ones are new. I mean, in, in the DSA, as we know it, yeah, it's the organization built by Harrington. But its dominance is sort of an explosion itself is new. So I agree with Lexi on that. G- agree with whomst? I mean, Esri, sorry. Well, I think I think what we're seeing is the narrative spinners can't keep up with this one. And it's like they couldn't keep up with Occupy, but Occupy wasn't all that violent. It wasn't that large. It wasn't that dynamic either. It was pretty dynamic for a short time there. Well, it, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe I'm forgetting. Yeah, maybe I'm forgetting. Yeah, I was about to say, like, you had you had Occupy's breakout in Austin and Atlanta and in and in Seoul and in Taipei and in like, Even like Denver, there was some shit going down. I remember when that happened. I was like, "What? Oh, okay." Let's <laughs> talk <laughs> with Denver. Everybody but, hates but, Denver. Even but, John uh, Denver. So that was a that was a social protest, and it was a social protest again. I mean, we forget this because it was aimed at Wall Street. But what made it grow? What gave it social legs was the fact that the cops beat up protesters on camera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. No, that's certainly true. That was true in uh, New York. That was true at uh, Davis. I was attending UC Davis. When I saw the cops coming, I'm like, well, I'm getting my laptop and stuff and my tent. And I got to I got to leave. And then, you know, (laughs) some some kids got like pepper sprayed in the face. And that actually brought like a huge number of people to give a shit about it. One of the things I've been thinking about in regards to this and why Marxists have been caught so off guard by so much is we haven't built another working class institution in 
And the working class institutions are in on this. I mean, like the various busing unions have been participating. I think it's interesting that also shows the division in unions, like the teachers unions yes. and not are very quiet. They're not condemning or condoning, but the, the working class public official, like, like city workers unions and stuff like that are clearly on the side of the protest rioter revolters, whatever you want to call it. And these are, right. and these are the actual unions who in their day to day jobs sometimes rely on the cops. That's what makes it surprising. You know, if there's something going down your bus, you have to ring a cop, you know, like, so right. that makes yeah. it even more impressive. But yeah, the, other, the other thing is the cops unions turn on this cop and that's never happened before. I've never seen that before. They usually close ranks. Right. So the cop unions knew that they couldn't close ranks on this one. What I think what they were hoping is they could, you know, sacrifice this one guy to mammon. Now, I read those charges, by the way. I think the, the, the historical tactic that has been done from George Zimmerman, you know, down is to overcharge because there's a large public demand for it. But the overcharge is impossible to get under current law. Like Zimmerman could never be convicted on the first, for example, on a first degree murder charge. It would not happen. Unless right. he was black. Uh, yeah, basically, but they like they they overcharged him to appease the crowd, but also to get him out of it. They didn't do that this time. However, if you actually read the legal complaint, there's language that makes it sound like the death is is quote unquote accidental and may not even be negligent because the kneeling on the neck, while not encouraged, is an acceptable use of restraining force under most police operational procedures. Those vary by state by states, but it's legal in Minnesota. It would be. And, and the only thing that would have, there are, you know, if the suspect is shown to be in severe distress or like you're supposed to back off, but if there's any correlating factors at all, you know, and, and, and there's a good bad cop narrative for this one because like, for example, this guy's been involved in, in the death of... Of black people before. I mean, like during the end of Klobuchar's reign as attorney general, Klobuchar and her successor refused to prosecute those. Like this guy was in that. So there, there, there's right. a history here. So like having him take the personal fall for this does fit the bad guy narrative, even though the structural things that keep it there are still would still be there. And I think people know that. And, and so like the, the fraternal older and all that trying to sacrifice them aren't going to work. Also, there are three other cops involved. As right wingers will surely point out to you, those three cops aren't white because that's not that relevant. Like that, that narrative that this is just personal animus isn't going to fly. Plus, we've seen riots like this over this kind of stuff off and on since the 90s. I mean, you know, Ferguson was pretty intense, but this is something else. Like it hasn't yeah. really hit, hit this. I mean, and may, maybe I'm missing out on historical examples. Sixty-five is, is where stuff like right. that yep. the, the the Watts riots, sure. But I'm just saying, right. like, since since the LA riots, you know, there hasn't been a comparable a, an incident of comparable intensity. That now I'm going to speak in terms of tactics. I'm well aware most people involved here aren't thinking tactically or or like strategically. They're just sort of like going along with something. But you know, riots can effectively get demands as if it were a tactic. So I'm going to assign some emergent strategic rationality here that isn't necessarily at work in every actor. But like, yeah, there, there hasn't been something that has been as much of an advance on autonomous tactics, you might say, um, <laughs> like, you know, since, since the LA riots. And this has like, this has social legs. I mean, from the readings I've done, you know, and I was... I was alive during the LA riots, but I was very young. So I had, you know, very warped perception of it. Like, oh, it's just sad, you know, like, but this, this seems to have more social legs, certainly than the rot, the, excuse me, the Watts riots, because it was very controversial. But even from like the, the LA riots, I remember, I mean, I was around a lot of people that were like both sides in it. I don't really hear as much of that these days. So, so what you're going to see now, I think is what's different is, there's no Reginald Denny case. There's no trucker getting pulled out of a truck and getting hit in the skull with a brick who, you know, some white working class dude who just happened to be there. There's no raiding of the Korean neighborhoods. There's no yes, obvious right. intra brown because one of the things about the LA riots that, that was used to discredit them is there's intra brown and black violence. And in mm -hmm. fact, more Latinos died from both rioters and, and cops from what I've read than black people. 
In the LA riots? In the LA riots, yeah. Mm. Um, and that's left out of the narrative. So none of that's happening. You, your random targets are businesses, not people. And they've even been relatively targeted about businesses. From my experience, yeah. wink, wink, uh, not that, you know, from people I know, from friends I know uh, that are my friends um, that have been in, you know, sort of autonomous, uh, rioty situations. Like, people could be pretty damn indiscriminate in a way that's, like, clearly harmful. And, yeah, okay, so they smacked up the library a little bit, whatever. But, like, they've been relatively targeted in the M- Minnesota, like... Uh, right. There have been some small businesses that were uprisings. here that are supportive. But most of the small business owners are just like, you know what? We got insurance. I've actually Can, read, like, I've read Patricia yeah. Law, who's like, yeah, we got insurance. We forgive you. Keep doing what you got to do and get justice. Yeah. I'm like, we want justice. No, I... I I, I want to like focus in on on that because it brings up the discussion of the petty bourgeoisie that we had last time. And right. ulti- ultimately, they can side with their obvious class interests. And yes, there is a class interest there. There's a, pr- a small proprietarian structure to their lives that they can choose as their overriding principle. But it's not the proletarian, it, you know, it's like... If you're if you're not a proletarian and you follow your sort of economic interests, it definitely leads you away from you know defense of the proletariat. These people, this is where I think the concept of justice is most important: is actually persuading people out of their class interest towards the proletariat. <laughs> yeah, or, or right? people, or, or if they're close to the pro- proletariat. Like I think if we want to, if they're close the- to the proletariat, then their economic interest, you know, can still be said to line up with. Oh, well, let's just not do this whole thing anymore. Right. I think actually they're close to. The, uh, for one, a lot of the businesses that are getting that that are taking this are small enough businesses that, economically speaking, if you're a pro who has a job that pays more than ten dollars an hour, and you are one of these guys, the pro is probably actually doing better. Super super low rent, like small yeah. business. Yeah, yeah but there is there is such a thing. Well, what we got to think about as well is why is it happening now? All these small businesses are probably basically either going under or breaking even. You know, like they're not making money right now in the structure of the economy, how it is with the coronavirus and all that. I would not be surprised to see these petty bourgeois interests line up with the protesters because they're getting fucked over versus big capital. The stock exchange yeah. is going up. Right, but the petty bourgeois, mm-hmm. the, the, the the streets you see on here and the shops in 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 London, like in, in the place where I live, Woolwich, all the smaller shops are shutting down. A lot of them are shutting down in the high street. That's going to be like that's going to be the case on all of these towns all across America. All of these petty bourgeois stuff are going to get absolutely destroyed through this thing. And in their interest now, it's not surprising we see them lining up with the proles attacking what they, who they see is the Amazons and all these getting away with stuff, you know, the Uber Eats or whatever, even though they're losing essentially 40% for every dollar they invest, which is fucking staggering. Economic rationality, Tom. Don't question it. But like, I, I see that there's great hope for like the emergence from a, a thing like this of people deciding fuck the Democrats. And, uh, but like, I, I think there is, it's definitely there's something in the air or there's something possible now who knows what will happen but i think you know i don't know i don't know if we are i don't know if we have enough cater or organized or socialist or communist to to actually get something off the ground even in this fertile a period but there's yeah. definitely something happening you know i talked about this off air uh, like like i think we both needed to focus in on Bernie, but it's also cost us a lot in alternative structures. And, you know, it, it's, it, I don't know what the right answer to that question would be. The one thing I can say is that there's a definite class character to this, but it's not as clear. Like if you, if you think solely in terms of bourgeois versus pro you're going to have a hard time understanding what's going on because the anger isn't like people like, yeah, they're going to burn banks because it represents rich people, but they're not really mad at target. Yeah. Fuck target, but they're not mad at target. What they're mad at is the fucking state and that the state clearly sides. I mean, like the state clearly sides with the, with the largest end of the bourgeoisie. No Sorry to interrupt. In, but even uh, even this election of the target was 
in part motivated by that specific target's relationship with the local police force. Right, right, right. I'm not sure if people are really thinking like in uh, class terms, but I think that they might like the main portion of people that are uh, upset are proles. Our reserve army of labor are are frankly lumpen. I mean, like, or unemployed, uh, or just I mean, literally recently I, unemployed. Yeah, the dispossessed, uh, the, the greater proletariat. Yeah, but I think reserve army is is it's pro. Right. I've always thought class consciousness and cl- uh, was was the wrong thing to care about, and one of the reasons why is that it emerges organically. In moments like this, and you don't need it, no one needs to be explicit about it. You don't have to like we have solidarity amongst the working class. We have solidarity amongst people who live like us, which of course are gonna be the working class, but there might be other classes. But the thing is the bourgeoisie, like no one knows where the fuck they are. They do know where the cops are, and they do know somebody is employing those cops, and they do know somebody had a political system. I mean, in a way the the you know, you were right, Tom. I guess maybe you said this off air too that Bernie was the last release valve and that people just didn't try to go there. I think they had to go through, like, as in, you know, from a kind of systemic point of view, like the system is set up in such a way that everybody's told this is how you do it, that that this was how they were going to try and do it. And the fact that they got shut down has led to this, you know, one had to come, but we would not have had this without Bernie. If Bernie had have, had, had have got the nomination, this wouldn't have happened like this. You know, the, the, Bernie was the release valve. They, you know, like we have this argument all the time and you say like, Derek, you say like, it's, well, it's all in legislation that you have, this, the parties are legislating and true. But it's like, you know, this is the, this is the, the dialectic. You know, this is the, this is the counter reaction. I, I think that point might be somewhat overstated, Tom. Like, it, I think that there is more support for this as a result of, of the Bernie movement being completely shut out. But mm-hmm. I don't think it was the necessary precondition for something like this happening. Yeah, because it's happening to different people. Like, pro- probably most of the people riding weren't, like, disaffected Bernie campaigners. No, what, age are, yeah. what age are they? What age are these people writing? We don't. Some, some some of those people don't put their hopes in stuff like Bernie Sanders because I, I know, they, I know, they know that. where it goes. I know that, but they all look primarily under the age of 30 and Bernie was popular there and they all know that he got fucked, right? Like, I, do, I as, think that plays as, into why, it's at least I, some of it. I, yeah, I'd like to suspend our judgment f- for, you know, because we, we don't know, like, what they what exactly they're thinking in regards what, to that. What um, I can right. tell you, from my perspective, we can suspend judgment on the Bernie question because I, I actually don't think we can know. But one thing I can tell you from my perspective is what it did point out to everybody is representation didn't matter. We can move the social dial and it have no political effect. It doesn't follow the same like happy go lucky thing as like gay marriage did or whatever. We move the social dial and it does like the social dial. I mean, gay marriage, gay marriage. Okay. All right. Gay marriage doesn't affect like it doesn't affect the so like it affects people's social life, but it doesn't affect the economic life. The the point the point that's being made here is that the way gay marriage was achieved was like through some like deus ex machina through the courts. Right. Like, like like the courts, which are like the, you know, yeah, I I know know there's a history of judicial activism, blah, blah, blah. But if you're actually engaged with political literature, the courts are the most like aristocratic institution in liberal democracy. And, (laughs) and they just had to hand down, a decision to keep up with social progress because the political machine is so conservative. Right. Because the legislative couldn't do it. And even the, even like Obama opposed gay marriage until he didn't. I mean, like the fact is the courts could only ever do something like that where it doesn't affect the economic system because it's only on the, on a, you know, a personal social level. It's not an economic thing. This actually, this shouldn't affect the, the, like, Having the police kill less people shouldn't affect the economic system either. And in fact, frankly, one of the reasons why even the l- larger corporations have been somewhat progressive on this is so prisons are a tax drain that we can't deal with. We're cutting education funding right now because it's what you always do in a downturn in the United States. But it, between the states, it's going to be between 5 and 25%, depending on the state. Okay. But... 
people are realizing they're the only reason people could go to work is because schools were effectively a way to regulate the workforce. But and I mean literally in the sense of we kept people from having to be at home nine months out of the year to watch their kids, and we kept people out of out of the job market without them showing up on the unemployment scales. And that's that's becoming more and more inefficient and administratively captured too. So there's an anger about how administrated capitalism has become. There is there is a truth, you know, we've heard all this, you know, theoretical infighting between, you know, and the Bernie postmortems and and going back to traders like James Burnham who flipped from Marxist into being in part of the CIA about the managerial class, about the professional managerial class. That's a distraction from like what's actually going on, but there is a real core of management here that people are getting fucked by, and it's now becoming obvious, and you can't deny it anymore. And so, like, what my point earlier about this is not pearls versus versus the the bourgeoisie. This is pearls versus the state. The state is a class organ, but they're mad at the state. Yeah, and look, I don't know how representative this is of what's going on i would wager that perhaps some of the people who start doing this have some ideological sort of left of the dial socialist commitments let's say or liberal commitments or something but when you see something like looting and distributing goods i love that that's something that always with the sort of tongue in cheek and like we're you know we're so clever the communizer crowd would refer to as an expropriation and as a communizing measure, right? Because what you're seeing is in, in accordance with the sort of communism just sort of bursts forth from the world. You have this in the middle of a, you know, an, an uprising for whatever reason, you get redistribution of capitalist property. <laughs> and it's most propaganda of the deed, lumpen, voluntarist, you know, Bakuninist form, right? Like, is just smash the shop, give it to people. I'm sure that some of the people that were doing that had political motivations. But however, things like that can spread. You know, resonant behaviors in an action situation can spread, like a meme. And I, I wonder how widespread that type of thing was. I kind of think people are just, like, jobless and <laughs> have no money. <laughs> And or need food and like are upset that somebody stepped on <laughs> they're executing black people. That's a lot yeah. of that. Seriously. But, but that's, that's why like you a just, very that's simple why, explanation. No, but that's why you take food, but that's not necessarily why you distribute food. Well, here's the thing though. I'm gonna d- defend weirdo anarchists and all this for a second, as much as I complain about them. During this coronavirus crisis, because the state, the best it could do is three months of extended unemployment, which actually is one of the few times where the state picked the workers over the PD bourgeoisie, which is why you had those haircut shit going on. Yeah, yeah. Despite that, and despite the $1,200 one-time payment, no other relief is coming. Congress won't even relieve the states. All the burden of the expanded programs are on the states. States have ballots, but budgets, amendments, et cetera, and so forth. They can't, they can't do currency finagling to get around it. Not all of them do, but most of them do. So here's the question. People are seeing there is no relief. In this time period for the last three months, every major city I know has active mutual aid. Like even here in a conservative city like Salt Lake, we've been doing active mutual aid. I, I helped the Navajo Nation do it. You know, I've been helping anarchists run supplies, getting medicine to people because no one else is fucking doing it. No one. This yeah. The condition that historically Marxists called dual power and what and what you know I know people claim it, but anarchists do it too because the state is failing, and so the only way to do it is like you know get on it. And honestly, right now hostility to small businesses has declined because in the cities because like they've been kind of on our side. Like we had a distillery started producing massive amounts of hand sanitizer to give to the places in the Navajo Nation who, ha- who don't have water and water. I'm normally not on board with that shit. I normally think it's a tax grab, but it's not in this case because shit is breaking down and the government is sitting on its hands. And yet 
we can all see production hasn't stopped. We have a crisis of over fucking production. It's both. Right. It's like a supply and a demand shock at the same time, really. Right. Like we get like, but like, there's still food. There's still plenty of shit. Like I can still go to the grocery store and find most of the stuff I need. I might like for this week. It might be there's less things in tin cans because it's harder to get cans right now. And some days there's no meat, but whatever. Like that's where we're at. Like yeah, this this isn't strictly like a bread riot. But don't you think the demand has fallen quite a bit? Demand and supply have fallen. I think you have supply but, shocks, but you ha- but you have demand yeah. drops, and so like you know, and and I'm hearing even liberal economists talk about how this is going to be a fucking V. In fact, the Democrats are now worried that it's going to be a V, and that's what like predicted and all the smart. And I'm literally I have no idea where that's coming from. You know, China's freaking the fuck out right now. Like also the international <laughs> context for this. Like, I know I have friends who's like, well, this is the empire declining, and it is, but there's nothing else on the horizon. Like, Xi is fighting with, with India and pulling all sorts of shit because, frankly, his economy just fucking tanked, and he can't do much about it. And all those people who are like, well, they have MMT, and they can just print their way out of it. You can't. If the international market fails, you cannot. It's true. Like we're going to have a, we're going to have GDP probably fall across the planet by about twenty percent or something this year. That's right. just that's just the way it is. And why is that happening? Because people aren't working as much and people aren't consuming as much. It's fucking rocket science. You can't just MMT your way out of it because you'll just cause inflation by giving it. So you have a, a weird thing. I think though in America it seems like that because the main parties were able to basically give nothing to people and once off twelve hundred dollar check. Because they thought their class power was so strong, they just dealt with Bernie, and they've they really have, have have no organized thing. They thought they could get away with it, and I think we're seeing like this is like a a full on fucking reaction, and it, it shows how weak these systems are. To me, it just shows an America system is is fucking weak. Can we get around to discussing a little bit about well, what would it, what would this look like? And this is a fucking what if. This is like Marvel Comics used to have what if. Uh, series you know what if oh hell if, yeah yeah i remember i used to like that what if thor was like made of cheese something like that but like what if probably less uh, more likely than what if we had an organized timeline if we had if we had organized left and we had workers militias what the hell would this look like it would look like a civil war it looked like yeah. 1917 yeah. 1917 what, what would it look like if we had organized workers militias well, uh, does it remind you kind of like 1917? Like uh, there was the Bloody Sunday where the military started shooting on the protesters? It reminds me a lot of it, but there there are some things that are fundamentally different. We're not in the context of a world war. And even though my friend Douglas Lane thinks that because of Heinrich Grossman's theories, we're going to be. <laughs> um, Wait. What, what, why does he? What, what makes him to make those? The, the, the unconscious, the, the crisis leads to unconscious political decisions to destroy capital. Oh, but there's many ways you could increase the rate of profit. It's not yeah, just well, war. I pointed out that even Grossman has other means of dist- of capital destruction, mm-hmm. and, like uh, certainly, global warming, or certainly, yeah, nuclear bombs are a structural change. You are, know, I mean, fuck it. Honestly, riots are. Riots are a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Riots are a regenerative mechanism in the emergent sense and capital yeah. overall rationality. Yeah. In, in addition to being like actual, the only actual like real outbursts of like open class conflict that you get. What about the most obvious one? Fucking pandemics. Yeah, I was about to say like, don't you think it's going to clear out like a lot of the f- fixed assets? Like- yeah, it's going to be, it's going to cause <laughs> A shitload of capital destruction. The other thing, Any, anything that's bad for human beings. <laughs> you got to get rid of. Phys- you actually eventually do have to get rid of physical commodities. Like I think the theory- all real estate just gets revalued in half. There you go, man. But uh, I think the theory says that if the in- in- the inventories and the circulating assets go down, then the pri- rate of profit will will raise. So, like, it, it depends on what the fixed assets do. Right. The, the other part of Grossman's theory is he <laughs> thought that eventually it would cause proletarian class consciousness and thus lead, not automatically as in the common turns position, but 
kind of stochastically into mm-hmm. into a revolutionary phase. And the entire history of the Frankfurt School, honestly, in, in addition to dealing with fascism in the Soviet Union, is also dealing with the fact that Grossman doesn't seem to have been correct in the 40s because they couldn't predict where the auxiliary classes were going to go. And this has actually changed my opinion on like how we deal with the petite bourgeois, for example. Wait up, wait up, wait up. But you said that, like, what about stochastically? And uh, you said, like, it'll develop randomly, right? Yeah, that, that well, it, it, will, it won't be, auto, it will not be automatic because of immiseration. That there's got, like, a certain set of conditions has to kick in in a particular crisis to force something like class consciousness across the board. This, well, I mean, it's kind of undoubted, it's kind of undeniable that it's random, right? <laughs> like, more or less. Well, I mean, historically speaking, no, that is not what the Marxists thought. The Marxists thought that Hegelian necessity meant that it was going to be, it was going to proceed amongst smooth lines. And that was true for both the Leninists and the Social Democrats who picked up Hilferding's monopoly capital theory. They reacted well, differently. I mean, Hilferding's monopoly capital theory, it predicted that if we, de- if we develop big business to the point that it was sufficiently advanced. Wait, 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 wait. You said that, oh, yeah, they thought it was inevitable. But I mean, even if you hold that it's like, I mean, obvi- I mean, it has to be like, I mean, it's clearly random to some extent because like, I mean, it's like so complicated that, I mean, you can't deal with it. Yeah, like, you're not thinking- <laughs> Welcome to Marxism, Puya. <laughs> like, you're dealing with adults that believe in like totalizing forms of causality I that mean, like- just have to unfold. Like you're dealing with like secret, like crypto idealists that are deep in the closet. Like, right. I mean, even if it the was idea will like, there's no way you could deal with it all, like, because right. there's so like, many. Because you, you, so are, many... you are still thinking Marxism is a multivariate analysis because you know Marx worked that way, but Marxism, my friend, has not historically worked that way. Oh, so, yeah. but, uh, we could talk about this all night. But let's oh, say yeah. that uh, even if you thought like, okay, so whenever it happens, it's like mostly random like you know Mm -hmm. probability changes you know depending on whatever you you know like the crisis happens and the probability goes up right you know well and like but you're you're thinking in a completely different paradigm of analysis is i think what's being said here like you know thinking stochastically thinking out of thermodynamics is not how these early marxists thought that just was not their paradigm of analysis. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense, you know, in terms of like doing better analysis, but it's just, it's just not what it was done. I agree well, with you, Julia. But also, also, but Dex, I mean, so- like you can come to like a mostly deterministic conclusion, like, I mean, yeah. Cause like you can say, oh yeah, the probability is going to be like one at sometimes. So, the you know, the, the, the law, of large, law of large numbers and shit takes over in these random events. But like here, like, like let's say like you say okay, so like, uh, what are you gonna say? What was you're gonna say? Okay, so the what what are we trying to predict? Well, I wasn't. I, I was actually talking. What I wanted to talk about is that these. these what, what are we if, trying to predict? If I understand correctly, we're trying to predict whether or not like some revolution is gonna happen. Right? No, actually, no. I'm not. What I what I'm trying to say is historically we fucked up because we thought certain things were automatic, and I'm gonna give you the example. Hilferding's monopoly capital theory led the social Democrats to adopt a stance that they had to develop capital to a point that even if it, and it was almost accelerationist, and this was even backed up by Kowski in the 20s, that you even would participate in the dismantling of the welfare state to force more things into monopoly capital sectors. The monopoly capital would force some forms of miseration that then would lead to the seizure of the businesses by the workers, it was quasi-syndicalist even, with the, with the backing of the state to... Wait, Hilferding held that monopoly capital would take over. Right, the monopoly and, capital would take over. And then the workers would respond and take over? The state. Yeah, the, the workers would the workers would democratically take over the state and then seize the apparatuses of the businesses. So all they'd have to do was nap- was to finish nationalizing the already socialized monopoly capital large businesses, which led them to cut the welfare state and also make enemies with the petite bourgeoisie in extreme. Was that not linked up with uh, trying to defeat the Nazis as well, though, Derek? 
That was what led to the Nazis having any electoral clout. Lenin wasn't a monopoly capitalist, though. Like you said, he yes, was. He was. Ago, was he? Yes, he was. He just took. Yeah. A, he took a. He actually thought that what that meant was constant international war and uh, imperialism. No, but uh, that's a wait, theory wait, wait. of imperialism. Even if you okay, so you're saying like okay, so the Marxists they thought it was like deterministic, right? Like Hilferding thought that it was like. You know, like Domino. classical mechanics, like you push the thing and it goes down the hill. <laughs> like then, uh, billiard balls hitting each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, I mean, even if you hold that it's like mostly random, I mean, you can come no, to No, not if you're Hegelian, they don't, because dialectics means that, n- that, that there is no randomness in Newtonian mechanics. That's the difference. We, we come from like a post-Newtonian and post-Hegelian understanding of physics, but they didn't. Well, in Newtonian mechanics, there is no randomness. It's, I mean, Dang. the laws are quite simple. You know, it's force equals ma. I mean, there's no randomness right. in that, unless you add randomness into it. But like, right? But that, that's the to, point. But you would need to use something else, probably. It's a different you know, paradigm. Need, but uh, uh, we're we're coming from the future when we read Marxism and looking at this and kind of scratching our heads at using leeches when you know you know you need to do something else. Okay, so it's wrong to think of it deterministically. So we want to look at it. I mean, like, you can still hold that, like... No, I'm uh, not saying it's wrong to think of it deterministically. Okay. It's wrong to think of it linearly and necessarily. Like, that's 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 the difference. My, my, my point about some of this, though, in regards to these current riots is... Good. They screwed this shit up so bad that they lost any legitimacy over mass politics outside of the Eastern Bloc. And what did that lead to? It led to pseudo border partism. It led to, you know, the theory that the right opposition said that, you know, Bonapartists come to power and the left opposition said, no, this is like Bonapartism. It's the same function, but unlike before, this is a mass politics with a base of petite bourgeois, which you've alienated. It has made common cause with certain privileged strata in capital to hold up a bunch of inefficient businesses. And the other thing that the, the social Democrats and the Leninists eventually came to was that the state was class neutral. All right. Like that was an innovation and that was shared by both the social Democrats and the common turn. Although the common turn at least said there were capitalist states and socialist states. But the, the Social Democrats had gone back to the position had by LaSalle that the state was a class-neutral organ and all you had to do was seize its reins democratically. You didn't have to dis- you didn't have to take it apart. And like that also meant that the Marxists were associated with the reactionary state, which they have been the entire 20th century. And to be fair, Marx would always Marx predicted this as early as Brunner. Of course, they're always going to blame the socialists. When the capitalists fuck up ruling, they're going to scream about socialists and Antifa and anyone else. And somehow we're both the anti the state and the state at the same time. But like when we have no real relationship to it right now, honestly, in the United States in particular, we aren't part of this. We have no political power. So that analysis fucked us up. It's part of why the 20th century went down like a fucking bomb. Literally. It's like, Even if again, we're going to lose bad. Maybe maybe we need to answer this question about, you know, how are things going to play out from here? How things would play out from here if only we had workers' militias. So I think the example of the 1930s kind of proves a point that we need to look at seriously is that the type of people that militias that have a voluntary aspect to them, even in the best of times of class consciousness, has a sort of selecting effect for, you know, not exactly representing the proletariat in full, but, you know, putting together, at least in contemporary conditions, where like, whatever you want to call it, but there's been a sort of softening of social life. Like some people, like most people used to know how to fucking shoot a gun, or like use a knife or something. And now like a lot of people don't, a surprising amount of number of people don't. Like even in America, if you live somewhere where everyone knows how to use a weapon, you'd be surprised how many people basically don't have their self-defense license. (laughs) 
<laughs> right. Like, I mean, it's amazing how many people don't know how to shoot a gun in America, including even on the right with people carrying them around. Like I've laughed at, at both right and left wing protesters of how they've carried their weapons around. It's just kind of sometimes laughable. Has anybody seen this like meme of uh, pointing a, a, a loaded gun with the safety catch off at your own dick? Yes. Taking photographs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Esri, what was what was your point there? Oh, like, my point is that like depending on you know what happens with militias or if the state's involved with the militias, you might want to, you know differentiate between state militias and autonomous militias. But even if we are talking about autonomous militias in the United States, like even if you're including, even if you have a broader notion of what militias are and you sort of communize it and you, th you think of like a gangs or, or something as having like militia properties or whatever, however you want to stretch mm -hmm. the definition. Most of the militia formations we see are quite, like have quite reactionary like social interests and how do I put this? I don't even know if they have reactionary social interests, but they are kind of consistently cut to the right. Like well, they're in, in contemporary of formations. Like, like one of the things about that though is like how much conspiracy theory culture is in that and how much that does cut to the right. Because yeah. it comes out of explicitly anti-communist you right. Know, well, what, so and racist basic, and racist stuff, like let's be honest. Yes. Well, but that's that's all 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 that stuff is tied together. You know, Adorno uses anti Semitism as a sort of like like he studies it not just because it's incidental to the, his time, but I don't know if he ever says this explicitly, but I th but he so they sort of and the Frankfurt School more generally also, like sort of treat anti Semitism as this like ur form of irrational rationality that you get out of the enlightenment as this like absolutely bizarre secularized, you know, religious fetish ideology that like reifies a part of capitalist life. It, it is important to kind of call this as like a reactionary tendency as something that leads to a sort of totalitarian thought. Like if the Frankfurt school means anything, <laughs> Right. It's identifying how when there's a crisis and you have militias, instead of getting communist utopia, you get fucking, like, you know, it's like hyper nationalist, like fascist shit. So I, what I, you're yeah. saying is, given Tom's proposal, like, what if we had workers militias in this situation? The answer is they'd be so influenced by anti-Semitic conspiracy thought and the peculiarities of arms training in America and who has access to it, that they would be reactionary. Unless workers' militias mean something extraordinarily different from the militias we know in the ways that sometimes well, that's we a given. democracy like, I, I, in a normative way. Workers' yeah. militias would be auxiliary arms of, I don't know, trade unions. Yeah, okay. or, or, so or have reactionary elements in them, but they're not as a whole. Or no. just like working class neighborhoods or, you know what I mean? Like whatever form it takes, but it ha not just, it has to be within a, a, an organizational structure too. Not just the militia, but like there has to be like equivalents to things like the SPD or whatever it was around at that time. Like imagine there was an actual radical left party in America, a communist party that wasn't a piece of crap with 20% or 15% of the vote worker militias. I, I, I think it, it really comes down to what Derek was saying earlier, that in that case, which is very difficult to imagine in America, but let's, let's say for the sake of argument it existed, you would see this evolve into civil war. Right. Yeah. That's, this, that, this that's war. what we're saying. And we would probably lose. Just to yes. point that out. Like... Like, and I don't mean that we don't have mass stuff. The one thing that we have not dealt with in in all of our models of revolution that I think even the autonomous have kind of avoided is what it means to have a nuclear bomb. Because what that also, mm. the only way to win a civil war is to cut not just the soldiers in half, but to cut the ties of parts of the leadership of the army into the larger camp that 
can happen, but the, the, the thing that that risk is a degeneration into Red Bonapartism immediately. Right. Because they have a privileged position as essential to the revolutionary movement. Not as essential, though, if you have mass militias. Well, sure, not as so, but then you get the militia chiefs, right? And Remember, I, I like, don't think I don't think their their uh, control over sections of the military apparatus is immaterial, even in the case that you have mass militias, because like so, the, the destructive capability scale between a a group of somewhat trained militia people with guns versus the U.S. military is tremendous. But like, let, let, let's let's analyze that though. There, there was a, enough of like uh, troops fragging their commanding officers in Vietnam. Like, what the mm-hmm. fuck's going to go down in America if they got troops are going to start having to shoot on their own, not only uh, fellow Americans but also their own class? Like, I think it's and like in this scenario, like you would have to assume that the like if if the class war was being operated on such a level that it would also inevitably be operating within the military itself. And the military itself would be like overwhelmingly working class, not the officer corps, but like, you know, when the shit goes down, that it could it could switch. All I'm just trying to do is just trying to the reason why I'm saying all this stuff is to put it kind of into context versus what we have. We have no party, we've got no organizational structures, we've got no militias. You know, this is what we have. Just to counterpose it to people thinking about what could be, like what could actually be. Could things be like, you know, the 18th Premier, the, you know, some of the stuff that's gone in in that 1848 period, like the, you know, could it be like 1870? Tom, you said the secret word, 18th Premier. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.